Ladies and gentlemen, namaskar, and welcome to the 16th edition of the Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by Dettol, Banega, Swast India, at the Darbar Hall. We are delighted to introduce Points of View, an archival gaze of photography in India by Gayatri Sinha, introduced by B.N. Goswami. Gayatri Sinha's latest book, Point of View, Defining Moment, uh, Defining Moment of Photography in India, and the archival gaze, a timeline of photography in India from the 1840s to 2020, take a deep dive into the technological changes and aesthetic movements in photography across the Indian subcontinent. Focusing on archival and visual elements, the collections provide a much needed kaleidoscopic lens on photography in colonial and post-colonial India. I'm delighted to introduce our presenter today, Gayatri Sinha, who is a writer, art critic, and curator who works in New Delhi on the art resource criticalcollective.in. Her principal interests are art and photography, gender, and contemporary Indian social history. She will be introduced by B.N. Goswami, one of India's leading art historians and the professor emeritus of art history at the Punjab University, Chandigarh. He has received numerous awards, including the Padma Shri and Padma Bhushan from the President of India. Goswami has also written more than 25 books, many of which are classics today. Thank you. Essentially, I'm here to listen and not to speak, but it gives me great pleasure to be able to say a few words about the young scholars to my right, Gayatri Sinha. Let me caution you. The name comes from a Sanskrit word, Gayatri, of course, which means a hymn. Gayatri is also the name of a goddess. And the goddess has five heads and ten hands. So be prepared for Gayatri Sinha to be using not one, but two, but three or four hands and so on. So because she is multi-talented and she has done an extraordinary number of things, including these two volumes that she'll be speaking in a moment from now. But let me just take a minute or two to recall my encounter with the kind of world that she's inhabiting at this particular moment. I was teaching at the University of Texas at Austin, and I heard that there is a center here called the Harry Ransom Center, and it has the first photograph ever taken by Niepce, the Frenchman, she will talk about him. This is all a controversial thing and so on, and people have contested whether this was the first photograph or it was not and so on, but she will be able to throw light on that. But I made a beeline for that particular center and had the enormous pleasure of looking at that extraordinary document, extraordinary a view of Le Gras from his own bedroom on the second floor. The second encounter that I've had with photography, I'm not a photographer myself, and I love photography anyhow, was when two friends of mine were preparing something called an urban dictionary, and I was asked to write a short essay, and I wrote an essay on photo. And photo, that particular word has become, I mean, so embedded in the Indian mind now. Nobody talks about painting. I saw a photo of Guru Nanak. Now, for heaven's sake, who can have seen, could have seen a photograph of Guru Nanak? Paintings and photographs are being, in a certain sense, mixed up in the ordinary, in the common mind. So photo is what we are living with. Photo is what Gayatri has been living with for a number of years. And this is what we are going to hear from her about what she has been working on, 
how hard she has been working on and what extraordinary documentation she, along with her colleagues, has produced. Gayatri Sin. Thank you, Goswami Saab. I think for any historian in India to be sharing a stage with Dr. B. N. Goswami is, um, is something that gives you clouds under your feet. It is a moment of um, rejoicing and celebration. It's also uh, a tribute to his, uh, <clears throat> his uh, very wide coverage of the arts, including photography. He has written, in fact, about Maharaja Ram Singh, who we will be talking about today and who, is Jaipur's, who was Jaipur's own uh, photographer prince and is definitely one of the moving spirits behind photography as it has evolved in India. So the two books that we talk about are, um, are we able to get the images on screen? Sorry, is the, is the PPT working? Hello, uh, is the PPT working? Yes, can you? I don't see it, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the, the two books that we are talking about really are um, looking at photography as it evolved from the 1840s to 2020. 2020 being the cutoff date where most photographers couldn't actually move out because of the pandemic. And the 1840s being when India embraced photography with enormous enthusiasm, right from the royal courts to popular studios, uh, and there was a huge proliferation of the medium. I think this is worth doing. It's, uh, it's worth investigating because as a critic in, you know, in modern art practices, we've been taught that modernity comes to Indian art in the 1930s with Amrita Shergill, Rabindranath Tagore, Jamini Roy. That's incontestable. That is certainly um, the moment of modern art. But the moment for photography in India comes much earlier. And it displays a kind of resilience to the very nature of photograph. Roland Barthes talks about the death of the photograph. But the Indian consumer of the photograph contests it with great gusto. And I hope to be able to take you through some of the images that we have in the books. Um, it was an absolute pleasure working on these for about four or five years with my team at Critical Collective, the website that I run. And let me just walk you through this journey because India's photographic history is also the history of the nation. And um, it's very stimulating when we see how we move from photography perhaps as a highly individuated art form into a social and political history. Um, we can perhaps start with the colonial, the colonial photograph. And one of the most important figures in this time was, of course, Samuel Bourne. Samuel Bourne comes to India in 1863. He's an ordinary clerk in Nottingham. He spent seven years in India, and by the end of it, the production of the pictures is such that Christopher Pinney has called him as the most aesthetic photographer of the 19th century in India. I want you to look at the way he represents his images. Look at the single figure and the enormity of the pillars in Moti Masjid in Agra. And then one of his most famous pictures, the Manirang Pass up there in the Himalayas, 1865. This is just his second year. He has gone up to the Himalayas with about 60 coolies, a large wet collodion sort of, uh, you know, frames on which he dries the material from which the photograph will be taken. It's a hazardous process, a difficult process, and he earns enormous uh, respect. Um, Samuel Bourne, of course, also sets into process the, the firm Bourne and Shepherd because he combines with, its, with you know, different photographers at different times. But Bourne and Shepherd finally closes down in Kolkata only about 20 or 25 years ago. So this is the Manirang Pass. The important thing about him is what is he doing with the figure? It's diminutive, it's unindividuated and completely unrecognizable. But you see the grandeur of the landscapes. The 1850s, which is just before Bourne comes to India, is the period when the chemical, you know, chemical inks have come. The British have set out into motion. The East India Company has sort of retired its network of commercial interests is sort of pushed into a different kind of setup with the rise of the British Empire. 
And this photograph by Shepard and Teitler was actually deeply significant because it tells us of the, you know, the dissipation, the death of the Mughal Empire. And it was in a way to feed into the sentiments of, I mean, it reflects on the sentiments of 1857 and the first war of independence. Uh, by the 1860s, the British have set into motion, I mean, certainly the mapping of the country. So the archeological survey, the geological survey, the botanical surveys, and then most significantly for empire, the survey of the people of India. This eight volume uh, set of books, which is called the People of India, a series of photographic illustrations, draws upon British and Indian photographers to give you an image or to give the consumers back home in England, what do Indians look like? So the idea of grouping community, class, tribe, uh, and in a certain sense, even the kind of uh, livelihood or means of livelihood is attempted in this massive volume of it's about over a, for, uh, about 450 photographs. But the pictures themselves tell a different kind of a story. Here are a group of Nagas and we see a picture of a certain passivity that is built into the representation. I'm just going to show you two pictures from, these, uh, from this entire set. The, these, are, uh, these become representative of how Indians will be seen. Now, simultaneously, there is also the Indian photographer who is coming into his own. There is great curiosity about the new medium. Ships coming into Calcutta import the, you know, the materials for the wet collodion process. And from the daguerreotype to the wet collodion, studios are springing up. Some print on silk, because that is for the more expensive kind of client and some print on more ordinary material. This is John Burr, a very famous photographer who pushes all the way up to Afghanistan and takes these pictures. The first record of an Indian photographer who is not a prince would be Mohanlal and his brother Shivlal. These are the two photographers in the court of Udaipur and they are trained to work on the medium. So what do the royal courts want to produce? mainly portraiture, the portraiture of the royals themselves. And here Mohanlal has a very significant role to play. There is also a flourishing photographic practice that is set into motion in the state of Awadh. And the person over here who is at the forefront is Ahmed Ali Khan, a, nav a small Nawab himself, but quite brilliant in the manner in which he combines an architectural practice. He's actually a very successful architect of some of the Indo-Saracenic buildings that you can see in Lucknow even today. But here is Nawab Raj Begum, the daughter of Wajid Ali Shah, who is recorded. And if you see, you know, already the photograph is inviting the kind of processes that you attach to painting. For instance, I mean, in, uh, Sir will tell me a lot more about this, but the inscriptions in Urdu are quite typical of Jahangiri kind of painting and the fact that the subject could be described at some length with a whole number of honorifics and the, you know, the insignia of the court on top. There is another kind of photograph which is set into motion, and this is of the memory of the court of Wajid Ali Shah. I find these particularly interesting because they have comparisons with the kind of photography that was being uh, sort of brought about in Japan when the Meiji period is on its decline, but there is still a great nostalgia for the great kind of court apparatus, for the kinds of costumery, for the kinds of attitude and attitudes of a certain courtly life. Now this is, these pictures are of the courtesans, of the famous courtesans from the uh, album Beauties of Lucknow by the Roga Abbas Ali. Abbas Ali has done something unusual. The court of Ajit Ali Shah has been sort of shifted to, uh, you know, Matya Burj by the British at least 10 years earlier, 20 years earlier nearly. But here there is a recollection of the power of the courtesan, uh, of her great beauty, the fact that she was also the instigator of a certain kind of knowledge and cultural system within uh, Awadh. 
And the other kind of, the other area, apart from Delhi, Lucknow, Calcutta, which was flourishing was, of course, Western India. So this is Narayan Daji, a uh, uh, Maharashtrian doctor, who sets into motion a sort of a record of what were the popular pictures of the time. And here we see there are the Vallabhacharya Maharajas. This is a very significant photograph. It has the Maharajas sitting, posing for you. They have their instruments of worship. You know, they have the rosary, they have their ma malas, they have their kamandals, and they have the sitar. But this becomes a highly controversial document, and another photographer whom we will just discuss actually takes this into consideration. I wanted to show this picture to you. This was, we got this from Bonhams. But you know the chosen family for students of modern photography who look at Nan Golden, or, photog or even Dayanita Singh. The chosen family is the family of Pablo Bartholomew, the family of your embrace, the family that you've come into close association with through kinds of uh, you know, ties of affection. And this is hijras or um, transsexuals or hermaphrodites or eunuchs of that court, but who are here represented with all their attitudes, their hierarchy and so on. Here, the great Maharaja of Jaipur, and it seems so significant that we are able to talk about him today. And Goswami Saab has written about him in the Tribune. Savai Ram Singh was an extraordinary man because he recognized the potential of photography. When he's born in 1833, he's only two years old and he's orphaned. And a regent is running uh, the charge of the court. But Man Singh, uh, uh, sorry, Ram Singh, what he does is to learn what he calls English ways. So he learns the language. He becomes a striking modernist in his approach to the state. Roads, electrical lighting, railway systems, hospitals, the mayor hospital, um, women's education, a theater, the Ramprakash theater. All of this is initiated very quickly because he only dies at the, he dies at the age of 47. He's not particularly healthy. And then there is his portraiture, his self-portraiture. And he does this with great gusto. When they are cleaning the, you know, the city palace uh, environs in the 1980s, they find this hoard, 2,700 glass plate negatives, a number of books on photography, a uh, number of cameras dating to the 1860s, and a whole lot of tripods, paraphernalia, backdrops. This is a portrait that he takes. This is perhaps a self-portrait. It is put into this kind of oval and then it is circulated. He uses the postcard as a modern method of circulation. And there is a very particular political intent. If you look at his forehead, he's wearing the Tripundara, the marks of the Shaivite. Now this is, um, I mean, this would have been heresy or sacrilege at a certain time. He's actually gone into aggressive revolt against Vaishnavism, the worship of Vishnu, which was prevalent in his uh, family and in his court for hundreds of years. He even expels all the Vallabhacharya Maharajas that you saw in a previous picture. And he represents himself like this to send this message right across Rajputana, but also across the rest of India. He then also photographs very, you know, with great passion, the women of his, uh, we can, I would prefer to use the word zanana, not harem, because there are all the courtesies of studio photography which are extended to them. If we look at, you know, the history of Orientalism, which is rife at this time in Western painting, we think of Almata Dema, we think of Ang, we think of the painters of the Royal Seraglio, nude women in, in you know, in baths, etc. They're completely contrary, and Ram Singh is a, is a close contemporary, and, but he's giving you a completely different view. And there are hundreds of pictures of the women of his zenana, their jewelry, their clothing, their marks, because he's also converted all of them to Shaivism. Here we see on one side a cross-dressing woman, and the other side there is Ram Suki, identified as one of his favorites. And the a painter Val Princep, who has traveled to India, and he's looking at this, uh, you know, he's looking at the studio to be able to work. He's also invited into the haram uh, into, and where he sees Ram Suki and describes her as her favorite of the Maharaja and says that the women are treated with great dignity. I think what is important is to recognize, uh, sorry, I'll just 
uh, finish on Ram Singh. What is important is to recognize that Ram Singh gave the same formal uh, sort of protocols to the women of the Zenana as he did to all the British and the royal subjects. He goes on to photograph the Duke of Edinburgh and so on and so forth. The other great photographer who actually lays claim, I mean, Ram Singh's agency was to express identity, religious affiliation, record the women of his seraglio, and in a way, uh, create the first document of women, of women in South Asia, which is, so, which is so massive in its content. But the other person who does something quite remarkable is this gentleman, Umrao Singh Shergil, familiar to many of you as the father of Amrita Shergil. And he comes about 20 years after the death of Ram Singh in 1880. There is no understanding that there is a line of continuity. Umrao Singh Shergil spends his life in Simla, he, in Hungary, because he has a Hungarian wife who is here, Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette comes to India with the Princess Bamba of Kapurthala. The, they fall in love. And there are a number of pictures of Marie Antoinette in this kind of very oriental setting in the Shergil family home, uh, a certain exuding an air of luxury, lassitude, etc. Uh, we know that she finally commits suicide, and there is a wonderful painting by the grandson Vivan Sundaram called the Shergil family, which depicts, you know, the, the suicide in a sense of Marie Antoinette and the rest of the turmoil in the family. But Umrao Singh is quite a character. He has a highly performative sense, and this is where we understand what he's able to do with the photograph. For a long time, the family moves between India and Europe, Paris, Hungary, and India. And we forget, perhaps, that this is actually the time of the Second World War. But there is nothing. There is no document of agitation on the streets of Paris, crowds, lack of food. It's only the interior, his own family. Here, he's shot himself in the family home in Hungary, like an oriental gentleman. And here, in the same Hungarian village, he's shooting himself as a Hungarian like a farmer wearing clogs, out to perhaps get water from the well. So this sense of performing for the camera to perhaps um, elevate or change your identity, let it slip a little, is quite remarkable. And here is Umrao Singh. He's after a bath, self-portrait. Uh, what would be the pointers to this kind of photograph? Is it Nijinsky? Is it the interest in the Ballet Russe, which has taken Paris by storm? Is it the yogic posture, of which we will see a little bit more later? And the oddity of it all, there are no external pictures, there's only interiority. Here is his daughter, the famous artist Amrita Shergil, in a swimsuit and sandals, in their flat in Rubasano in Paris. So I'm rushing a bit, I realize I only have about 20 or 25 minutes and there's lots to show, but there's actually a lot to talk about Umrao. Umrao never shows his pictures. Ram Singh never photographs the women of his family. Umrao only shoots the women of his family and seems obsessed. And there is a very large corpus of works of the two sisters, their performances, changing of costumes, they are Native Americans, they are Parisians, and so on and so forth. And all of this is happening in the privacy of their home. I want to show you these two gentlemen as a mark of contrast, but also of comparison. Here is Ram Singh dressed like a Shaivite. There is none of the appurtenances of the palace, none of the luxury, that he's actually shot the Darbar Hall of the city palace. But here he is as a simple householder, elements of the puja, the marks of the Tripundara on his body, and here is Umrao Singh again in his langot, much like, you know, like Ram Singh, dressed in this slightly uh, affective, dancer-like posture. But they are both revealing a certain yogic asceticism. And uh, maybe we can talk about it in the question, in the Q&A. But there is a beautiful painting in the Music Gimme. And that is, I think, by Govardhan Sahab. And that is, um, Jahangir goes to visit the sage Jaswan. And that is Jahangir with his full imperial regalia, the great Maharaja of the whole of Hindustan. And in the foreground are the, the, you know, the horses whinnying away. You can almost hear the sound because there is such a crush of courtly bodies waiting for the Maharaj. But he, the great Shahanshah, crosses over a muddy path and goes to sit with the ascetic body. And that is this, you know, the Sage Jaswan. And what is interesting is that in the Tuzuke Jahangiri, it is recorded that thereafter, Jahangir stops, you know, 
destroying temples. His iconoclasm comes to a halt. So the power of the ascetic body, the yogic body, is very well understood in this land. I come to the next ex, you know, experience with the body and clothing. Gandhi is, of course, in line of this great heritage of a certain um, identification of South Asian masculinity. Here he and Ba have come back from South Africa. Why is he dressed like a Kathiawadi farmer is the question. He's after all a mode banya. He's a banya who has gone to England in a suit. He's an educated barrister. He appears in courts of law, but he re recognizes the need for identification and comes back as this. And then this wonderful series of pictures, which I had the privilege to curate of Walter Bozard. Bozard comes from Europe in, the, in 1930 and becomes the window to European you know, newspapers and publications of Gandhi because he accompanies Gandhi in the march from Dandi, uh, to Dandi, sorry, from Sabarmati. And there is the contemplative body of the Mahatma as we have come to recognize it. You know, it's well known that Gandhi visits Madurai in 1921 and he sees farmers laboring under the sun and they're only wearing that half langot, that half dhoti. And that is where he actually switches costumes to the unstitched garment of the poor peasant. But this is also the garment of fakiri, renunciation, the ascetic. So there is, he's drawing this kind of interesting line through history. Gandhi in Noakhali, there are riots taking place but he's dressed and continues to work in absolute silence. Uh, the next part is photographic enactments, which I will go through quite quickly. There is something about the Indian mind which refuses to accept Bath's idea of the death of the moment in the photograph. It wants to, or it seeks to perpetuate through a theatricalization of perpetuity, of an image in perpetuity, which doesn't mark time and place. And I found these wonderful, these pictures of the Manorath. What's happening here is that families have gone to Natwara to worship Srinathji at this temple site. But there the temple studios offer you this opportunity to be photographed. Your faces and your hands and your feet are then cut out and then pasted into painted bodies. And there you are then, you know, put against the God in a painting and you're worshipping in perpetuity. Time, space, temporalities are completely dislocated. And this is, I think, the, uh, the, the genius of how Indians use the photograph to actually temper it to suit their own idea of a work of art. We now come to pictorialism. Sorry, my apologies, which actually, which actually is one of the, the most important kinds of school or schools of photography, but we as critics of photography haven't given it that much interest. Shapur Bhedwar goes to Britain. He becomes a member of the Brotherhood of the LinkedIn. He studies in the Royal College of Art. And then he initiates what becomes a kind of a Parsi brotherhood of highly performative photographs. And we see how this actually casts a very long and uh, vivid shadow across the way Indians want to be seen. They want to be seen photographing themselves doing interesting things. Bhidwar imagines a Zoroastrian past. What would the Zoroastrians have been like? So we look at his pictures. This is Jahangir Tarapore who works with him, works later in his studio. So these highly affective kinds of pictures and Jyotendra Jain has drawn an interesting parallel between Bhedwar, Tarapore, Bhatliwala, uh, and all the photographers of this time with Ravi Varma. How you, were, how you could perform for the painting was also how you were performing for the photograph. Here we can see Pestanji, Bhatliwala. This, I mean, it's all highly staged within the studio as well as outside the studio. Uh, the most well-known performing for, for, you know, photographer plus artist plus auteur is of course Pushpamala. And she takes on the kind of colonial history of the image of the woman in uh, different kinds of postures. This is the tribal and she's done an entire series, I think of about 250 pictures of uh, women in, uh, native women of South India, where we see her on, in the left dressed like a toda. 
The Todas were, of course, heavily documented by the British. They were, you know, their heads were uh, measured by calipers, etc., to see what kind of racial typology could be attached to them. And on the right is mimicry of uh, Ravi Varma print. Shotgun Murugan on the on you know on my left, and two these are women photographers and their acts of mimicry. Uh, in gender bender kinds of roles. So Indu Antony and Vidisha performing a certain kind of mimicry of South Indian cinema. And Sunil Gupta, who did an enormous uh, amount of work to set this up. Unfortunately, this series of um, uh, homosexual men in a kind of a, a sort of orientalist bathhouse was banned in India. But here, we've, we're just showing you one picture. But this was a highly highly stagey notion of, of a brown man trying to integrate with a Western uh, a gay or queer culture. Gauri Gill, who stages these pictures with uh, villagers who paint their, you know, paint their own masks and then present issues of identity. So what are the, what are the issues of identity that are possible in this kind of setting? And then finally, two pictures by Anita Khimka and Imran Kokilu. These are taken at the time of um, the pandemic. How do people want to see themselves? They can barely move. What does the photographer do? So at the base, you know, at an in, in, uh, just outside her block of flats, she invites the other members of that block of flats to come down with what they believe is precious and stage their own portraits. And these are then pandemic pictures. The pandemic is a very significant marker, of course, for photographic practices because the camera turns inwards. It simply cannot go out. So your friends, your community, yourself, all of this becomes reflected at that time. Now I want to talk a little bit about the crowd. When we were putting together these books, what became very apparent was that Gandhi refers to the publics of India as the crowd. He says, I hate having to give darshan. I have a darshan dilemma. C.F. Andrews, his biography also refers to everybody as the crowd. Uh, there is this sense of the crowd converging and moving. And what does the crowd then signify? Is this the face of the nation? Is this the publics as we know them? What are the public spaces? Is there a public sphere like Habermas refers to the public, great public sphere of Europe where spaces are consigned for publics to congregate? What is this public sphere? If we are to think of a public sphere in modern India, perhaps the only maker of the public sphere would be Mayavati, who was determined to give space in her prayernasthals to Dalits. They had no sphere. But this is the crowd. And the crowd starts to, starts to have a certain identity in this you know, build, up to, build up to what we can call citizenship that comes about with 1947. And Ariala Azule has written about how the citizen is, you know, presses demands upon the state of how the state must behave or react. So this is possibly one of the early images by Deen Dayal of the crowds pressing in when there is the Delhi Darbar of 1903, the royals on their elephants and then the crowds, you know, seen against the dust coming together. But then the great instigator of the crowd, of course, is Gandhi. And Bozard captured, Walter Bozard, the German photographer, captures him here in Dandi, where you can see that there is no distance, there is no, uh, there are no barriers, there is uh, certainly no bulletproof glass at com as comes about later, but Gandhi as one of the crowd. And from this moment onwards, maybe of course the 1930s, we see his emergence as the icon, the icon who will be more and more distanced in a certain sense, and how the crowd can actually even deny iconicity. This is a wonderful photograph. I completely flipped when I saw this. This is Gandhi addressing a crowd during riots in West Bengal. This is a moment of epiphany. We cannot identify anybody in the crowd. The crowd is innocent of the photograph. It doesn't give a damn. It doesn't care about whether anybody is recognizable and the crowd never claims ownership of the photograph. So it's in complete contradistinction to the portrait in a certain sense because there's no relationship necessarily. But what we see is that here we cannot see Gandhi. We can only see the crowd. So the mobility of the mobility of the vast publics of India to determine the history of the country, to determine 
approval, sanction, uh, to, to decide criminality, to determine on which side they will go is something that we see on television even today. Of course, the great crowds of partition, uh, the, the influx, the rush of people. This has been captured by this kind of scene. This is from Wikimedia Commons, uh, but we've, we've got Ari Katia Bresso, we've got a, a number of photographers capturing these kinds of moments in the history of India. And then the most affective sense of Gandhi lying in state in Birla house, he's been assassinated, the mourners, and then how the mourners will swell. The crowds rushing to touch Gandhi's body when it is being carried away uh, towards, uh, you know, it goes to Allahabad and so on, and the rush of people, unidentifiable. And in a way, the document, the photo document at the death of Gandhi is probably one of the most powerful, poignant sets of pictures comparable to, say, to the death of Martin Luther King. What happens to the publics? They become from the devotees, from, from those in agreement with Gandhi in Bengal, they become the mourning nation. Look at these pictures. They are extraordinary. I mean, on your left and right, this is people swarming in their gate to get a glimpse of the cottage as it passes by. And what does the photographer do? You know, there is a wonderful uh, phrase that Susan Sontag uses of the recessionary moment. She says that the photographer recedes from the scene in a certain sense. So there is a pull, but this is, nothing can be more recessionary than this, than pulling back to get the enormity of the crowd. It's never going to fit your lens, but you try to get that historic moment. And I find this particular picture of the person who's, you know, climbed onto a lamppost, and there is one of the King George sort of portraits, and the new republic, in a certain sense, which is going to topple that very soon and install somebody else. This is a group of photographers. I found this an irresistible picture in the, in the Nehru Memorial Library. Right in the foreground, the only woman photographer is Homai Vyarawala. And Homai has started her practice from Bombay, and she's uh, close to Nehru. She never reveals uh, Panditji smoking because they all had such a fondness for him. So the photographers did their own self-editing. But here she is with a group of men in a van. You know, the photographer, the photographer must be given credence. Very often he was anonymous, but he left a terrific photo document. And then the street. Where do we see India's great publics? We see them on the streets, urbanism, unplanned sort of crowds, uh, and also indicators of perhaps lack of employment, poverty, the great crush. And this shot is a very particular one because it may not be the same city, but Bhupendra Karya, Raghu Rai, uh, and of course Salim Paul have taken shots of these, you know, the roads intersecting and the rush of people. So in a way, this is also what happens to the new republic, the belying of the promise. The, the congestion, the, uh, the rosy roti ke liye marna hai, matlab kind of the kind of energy that was filling into India's streets. And the rights of citizenship, which were so uh, determinedly fought for, determinedly fought for, and then where the crowd itself, in a sense, sort of explodes that, explodes that and denies that. These are the rioters during the Sikh riots, and this is Connaught Place, Hotel Marina burning in the background. Uh, how the crowd can actually, uh, actually disturb, disturb the intention of the Republic and become, in a sense, its greatest critic, its greatest threat, and document a different kind of history. Um, this is a fantastic picture by Ram Rahman, I think taken atop one of the bridges near Connaught Place, the death of Safdar Hashmi. And we, the interesting thing about this crowd is that the people facing us, many of them are recognizable. This is the artist community, the community of writers and so on, which have come out to mourn the death of Safdar. He was a theater activist and he was killed by uh, Congress workers. I don't even know what was the intention of doing that. And then this the spontaneous outpouring of grief at the death of this brilliant young man, Ram Rahman takes this picture. Also, that the fact that the crowd becomes a sort of a sort of a platform. It's difficult to think of a crowd as a platform, but 
Where do you allow congregation in India if not on the streets? So when feminism starts to sort of become explosive, protests against dowry deaths, protests against uh, laws which have unfairly dealt with women, which are just seen as domestic violence and perhaps swept under the carpet. Shiba Chachi's pictures actually put these into, you know, put these into very dramatic kind of interface where we are seen where the women protesting, the, here there is Satya Rani Chadda, whose daughter has been, who had aspirations for academics, et cetera, making a life for herself, working class family, but seen here uh, as the victim of a dowry death. Can the, can the crowd also approve of criminality? How many criminals in India stand for elections and get voted into power? So here is Phulan Devi, uh, and there is a crowd which is giving approbation, which is also curious. And here she's come to renounce, come to renounce, you know, the taking up of arms. Again, Shiba Chachi, which is the renunciation of, on the crowds of, you know, the, uh, the banks of the Ganga, this renunciation of identity, whereby you can shave your head and become uh, a renunciate and shed one identity. We see the clothes in the foreground. You shed your identity. You've assumed the cloth. And the anonymity that this offers you, and this is something peculiar and unique, quite unique to India. And I think we have, these are two pictures of the same act. How the site, in a certain sense, when, they, when people do congregate on a particular sort of calendrical uh, date, there can be these shifts in identity. Remarkable. And then this is the last picture. We've got a couple of minutes only. And the crowd and the, I think, the fail, failure of the, the promise of the state. And this is the pandemic where there is this terrible rush to go home. And we see that, we see that whenever this recessionary act has to take place, because how do you reveal what is happening in India at that time? And this sense of merging together, of wanting to escape in a certain sense, to escape one side for another. The safe haven isn't seen, but certainly the city as polluting, as generative of disease is captured quite beautifully in this picture. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to take them. Can we have a mic here, please? How many minutes do we have? I know I have to catch a plane, but Saab, would you yeah. like to say something? Yeah, I've several questions. So uh, my question is more around uh, because still uh, for the common man who still doesn't have access to social media or even to magazines, newspaper is still primary source of information. Uh, do you think that over time newspapers are failing in communicating the current situation through photographs to the common masses? You mean the you mean the coverage of politics across country? What politics is? and the recent. Uh, the situations around the people, the sufferings, everything. Because most of the newspapers are filled with advertisements. Yeah, but uh, in a general sense, what we've got with the, uh, for our book, we have relied heavily on newspapers. We've taken pictures of the 62 war. S. Paul, great photographer of 62 war, a church being bombed. Harbak Singh, the general of the Northern Command, uh, you know, that's also from a newspaper. This picture that you saw of the people rushing, this is also from a newspaper. So Hindustan Times, Indian Express gave us a lot of pictures, or rather we bought a lot of pictures. But if you're saying that the newspaper should uh, reflect on society at large and discuss that, uh, picto not only pictorially, even editorially, and even in terms of reports, certainly I think newspapers can do a lot, lot more. I'm so sorry, I don't think we have time for another question. Uh, we're, we're out of time. Um, I think we should just let her ask her question. Just one, please. Yes, okay. Just to be polite, please. No, I think that's important because I think the greater sensitivity to uh, the female body, whether it's your own or somebody else, within the context of India is of great significance. And the camera has, even in art, 
if you look at the way the, the lens is turned onto body parts, the performing body, the nude body, the nude body of a woman, like say, taken by a photographer, artist, like say Sonia Khurana, where she takes her own oversized body and represents it without a sense of beauty, is completely different from, say, a Prabuddha Das Gupta, who only wants to show desire, male desire, and the male gaze in a certain sense. Yes, of course, there's a huge difference. Thank you. I'm very grateful to you all. Thank you for listening. And with that, we would like to thank Gayatri Sinha and Bian Goswami for the stellar session. Um, authors will be signing their books at the book signing desk located just outside this venue. Thank you. No, no, it's fine. And she asked a good question. There it is.